you, man. Uh, but um, thank you all so much. And um, I don't know, I'm mic'd, right? Y you all can hear me? OK, I can project, no worries. Um, I'm, I'm Cuban. So um, I, I love this. Dr. Liber, how did you know I was a baseball fan? So there you go. Uh, uh, there you go. I, I am uh, resisting every urge to you know, try to practice my swing here. Uh, but uh, you know, this is so uh, awesome and, and such an honor to be here and uh, tell you a bit more about Cano Health, what we're all about and uh, how we are contributing to this paradigm shift in healthcare, to the necessary change that we need, that we as providers, as healthcare professionals, have been talking about, have been asking for, have been working so hard at, but there, there are barriers that we hit. And uh, we've broken through some of those, but we're still at such an early stage, but how exciting. And here in Las Vegas, it's really a microcosm of what's happening across the country. And let me describe to you what we've done here in Las Vegas. Before I do, let me just tell you just a few statistics. And thank you so much, Dr. Prabhu, for, for your introduction. And uh, you know, frankly, everywhere across the country that I go, I need I need you to do that introduction. You know, that, that's awesome. Um, but I've never heard it such a way, and I know you say my heart. And, and I'm like, wow, I, I'm, I'm next to Dr. Lippmann and Dr. Prabhu. And, you know, it's, um, it, it, I, I'm not sure that I can share that stage. Uh, but um, so, so humbling uh, to uh, have this enviable opportunity here in Nevada. Let me, let me uh, share with you some statistics. We're the only company that I know of, and please look it up, and um, if you know of another company in history, in the United States or anywhere, that have been able to accomplish this, um, raise your hand. We're the only company that has shown a mortality reduction among our patients. Published, peer-reviewed mortality reduction. Six straight years, about 60% lower mortality among our patients. So undoubtedly, third-party data, peer-reviewed, our patients live longer lives. We're the only company to have shown a mortality reduction among COVID. Look up American Journal of Managed Care. My old colleagues at Cleveland Clinic, also uh, head of infectious disease over at HCA, a, a variety of other researchers like Nova Southeastern University, they're on the paper. We lowered that by about 70%. And we did it in a population that's older, sicker, and poor. Our average patient is older. We serve mostly a 65 plus and elderly demographic. Although we are a population health solutions, we do not turn patients away. So we serve Medicare, we serve Medicaid, we serve Affordable Care Act, we serve commercial, we serve employers. We have a partnership here with uh, MGM as an example. But our average patient is about 69, 70 years of age. 80% of our patients are minorities, mostly Latinos and African Americans. But here in Las Vegas, a big Filipino community and you know, all sorts of minorities. And why? Because we build in those areas of town that are historically underserved, where we're needed the most. So we reflect the population in those areas. Also, 80% of our people are minorities because they work there. Those are their barrios, you know, their hoods, their neighborhoods. So we're very proud that in a statistically older, sicker, poor population, we're able to get better outcomes. And there's a lot of outcomes that we can talk about, like diabetes control, hypertension control, CHF readmissions, and you all know this as healthcare professionals. But while those could be considered soft, outcomes, and th there is an element here of, uh, you know, maybe cherry picking and manipulation. There's only one that you cannot do anything about, is, is the patient alive or not, and that's straight from Medicare rolls. And we've been able to show that mortality reduction. We're also the only company ever to have shown a cost of care reduction, not a trend reduction, cost of care reduction. We published that too. So 
as a function of time with Cano Health, patients actually spend less money. Why? Because they are healthier. So I'll let that sink in. Dr. Barbu said, and this is something we're very proud of, because we've inverted the reimbursement model, we invest a lot more in primary care and prevention than the rest of the country. Now, who here is a public health professional or has a public health background or has that interest? And in, there you go, okay. So if you read any paper on it, you'll see that it's generally two to one. If you make a dollar of investment in primary care prevention, you get two dollars of benefits in reducing unnecessary downstream complications, those late stage cancers, uh, those uh, exacerbations of chronic conditions. Just going to the ER to get your meds refilled, and how ridiculous is that? And how often does that happen? So, every other country in the world that's comparable spends about 15% of their healthcare dollar in primary care prevention. We in the United States, we spend six. So, where do you think the resources go, the incentives go? Where do you think most med students go? So, I'm, an, I'm a primary care physician, internal medicine provider. And if I prescribe the statin, I may get $80 for my consult. But if I put a stent in the patient, I get $1,000. <laughs> so, What's my incentive? I get paid the same no matter what to do great preventive care, whether I'm effective or not, yet I get paid orders of magnitude more if I treat the complications so the sicker the patient is, the better it is for me and my institution. And how backwards is that? How misaligned is that? And if we all look to each other, you know, how perverse that incentive you know, really is across the healthcare spectrum. And we as physicians, we fight it because of our professional ethic. And we have a patient in front of us, and when I was at Cleveland Clinic, it was tough. But there's RVUs, there's uh, limitations because of coverage and what we can do for the patient. There are no resources for social determinants of health, at least there wasn't back then in the 2000s, and how much are we really doing there? Because once I give that prescription, can the patient afford it? I give that referral, did the patient go? Did I get those records back in time? <laughs> you know, did uh, the, the, the patient you know, share with me in, in reality what he or she is going through that's affecting their care? The answer 90% of the time is no or suboptimal. And so what we did here is rather than talk about it, we did something about it. It was kind of crazy. And it was a tough go for, for several years. Uh, but um, after a while, thousands and thousands of patients voted with their feet, came to us. And they brought their friends and families. To this day, most of our patients come from friends and families as opposed to basically um, everywhere else in, in our sector. Um, we're very proud that we believe in two things and deliver on that to the best of our abilities and work every day to get better at it, which is we measurably improve the quality of care and we forge those lifelong bonds because you cannot get one without the other. I had a great medical school professor that the first thing that he taught us, and it stayed with me, is that nobody uh, cares how much you know until they know how much you care. And we cannot be effective as providers unless we're really building those relationships, providing all those uh, access points, and um, uh, building that support system. And if we do that, and they come see us more. And at Cano, the average patient comes to see us for primary care visits eight times a year. Anybody know what's the average across the country? Four. Three, but close. High-performing institutions, maybe four. 
our average patient sees us in general 20 times a year because we have wellness services, because we have dental. My beautiful wife right there is the CEO of our dental. I want to put a plug there for Camel Dental. So uh, <laughs> makes me go in every six months to get that cleaning. And uh, how's my teeth looking? Good? Uh, <laughs> I'm due, by the way. Um, so physio, cardiovascular prevention, for those who are vascular specialists, how much sense does it make to have a cardiovascular prevention program as part of primary care delivery? Diet and exercise classes, mental health offerings, 24-7 urgency line, Cano at home, all those things for no additional charge. The same amount of money that would be paid in the transactional fragmented system, we deliver all these additional services. That's that extra 6%. And going back, if other countries spend 15% and on primary care, and they, in general, spend 50% of what we spend, isn't that a correlation for all of you scientists you know, here in the room? Two times more in primary care prevention, half their overall cost? Mm -hmm. See, at Cano, we do the same. Public company. You can see our MLRs, our medical loss ratios. We save 20 to 30% of what's been well published as waste in the system. Our patients get measurably better care. They use about 50, 60% less the ER in the hospitals. They use more generics. They live longer, healthier, happier lives. And we're just getting started. So let me uh, now just go to Nevada and I'll, I'll be brief. Here in Nevada, as one of our, of, um, we're, we're in 40 plus markets, but this is near and dear to me. We came here, um, in the throes of the pandemic, and I think it, it hit here harder than anybody anywhere else. Uh, just the, the the industry here, um, and and just seeing those those streets you know, absolutely empty and uh, folks out of work. Um, and uh, you know, the, the, there's a you know big underserved community, and we're 48th in the nation in terms of uh, per capita docs. So we we already had a big problem and it seemed that it got really exacerbated. And this is a microcosm, this is America, these are the entrepreneurs, there's such energy here, and just look around and see the diversity. By a show of hands, I don't think you can get more than 10 or 20% in a demo group. So if I just, you know, how many Cubans, I'd probably get my wife and I. And then I got an Ecuadorian, Indian, Mexican, uh, you know, uh, all. Uh, if I keep going, you know, folks from the Caribbean, uh, folks from, uh, you know, other hemisphere, it, it's, it's crazy. Um, and people come here because they, they want an opportunity to lead their best life. And at Cano Health, we believe we're doing our part to help um, with a critical component, which is health care. If you're not healthy, you can't work. You can't pursue your passions. You got to you're gonna have a tougher time supporting your family. So if we, from a market perspective, can have a solution, and I think Washington is moving in the right direction, and they've set a goal, 2030, all lives be value-based care. But let's all agree that there's a significant amount of dysfunction up in Washington, and we shouldn't be waiting for the government. We should be doing something about it. And we are, and here in Nevada, we have 10 plus medical centers. We're honored to have Dr. Prabhu as our medical director, have Maggie Adias as our VP, uh, who now is over uh, all of our West Coast, including California and Arizona and New Mexico. We've invested thus far north of $30 million in Las Vegas alone. And you'll see that um, actually um, be duplicated. We build, and we're building world-class medical centers. Have you all gone and see them? I invite you to go and see them. We also buy practices, and we're looking for great providers. We have an affiliate model. So if you don't want to work at one of our centers and don't necessarily want to sell your practice, we have an affiliate organization, and you take whichever contract is better for you, Medicare, Medicaid, ACA, ACO, DCE, 
I'm going to go with the alphabet soup of all the acronyms. We have it all. Because it's about connecting with providers so that they can serve better patients. And through that, as a clinician founded and led organization, make a significant difference in the healthcare system so that we as Americans can, as we do across many industries, brag about having the best healthcare system. We have some of the best providers, some of the best institutions, some of the best research, but our healthcare system is broken. It's inequitable. And I think for the first time, we have a real opportunity here to make a difference. And uh, how proud are we to be a part of it and be here at this moment? So with that, I'll take any of your questions. And thank you all for your time. <laughs> any questions? Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. What is your secret to patient compliance and getting them to come in as many times a year as you do? Great question. So um, there is no silver bullet there, but it does come down to forging those lifelong bonds, serving the entire families. And um, our, our, our people um, really connect um, through um, being empowered uh, to learn more about the patient um, and um, serve more of his or her needs. So if, if you just do primary care or you just do specialty care and it's very limited in scope, it's hard to be a true medical home. But when a patient has a variety of wellness offerings and specialty programs, um, when a patient uh, you know, has uh, that 24-7 you know, access, and when we have um, proactive care managers, um, pr proactive member engagement you know, folks, um, it shows to the patient that, hey, you're not a number. We care about you. We have a kind of life program in that we reward patients for healthy living. So they get gift cards, N not much because there's the other component of compliance. There's only so much we can do there, too. But it's about, they can earn up to $60 a year. And for a lot of our patients, that's significant. Um, and they're, they're encouraged by earning their points uh, for participating in these activities. Um, but uh, when they have their dentist, their physiotherapist, their cardiovascular expert, their PCP, and th they are, we're, if, if Facebook and others are kind of like that social platform, you know, we are that medical social platform. If, if you come in and you see the wellness centers and, and, and folks just plug in, it's part of their life now. It's their second home. So when they do that, they encourage each other and they build those bonds with each other and with the office staff. So there's, there's not any one thing that we do but if you offer more services in one roof, if you offer more proactivity, if you give folks incentives, that's how you get better compliance. Yes, sir. Uh, and, and there are great providers and there are great companies. Um, but it's still more healthcare. Um, 
the integrated delivery systems with a primary care and prevention model is limited in the way that we're defining, the way that patients are demanding uh, and the published outcomes are showing. Um, there is a role for ACOs and there's a role for hospitals. We need them. There's a role for the independent uh, primary care doc. We need them. In fact, we're short of them. But when you look at what's available in Nevada, what's available throughout the country, it's hard to get beyond 10 to 20 percent that are in truly aligned relationships with patients. I'm talking about that I am financially responsible 100 percent for their care, for their clinical outcomes. And so our model of primary care, and um, it's, it's a good question, so how, how do we compete? I think we've, we've shown that quite definitively. We are already a very significant provider of primary care in about a year and a half uh, into it. If you see our published results, we have incredible growth. We grow at four to five times the rate of the market because patients are driving that growth, because they want the additional services, because they, do, they cannot afford in many cases that extra co-pays for those services or to go to different uh, places. And so I think the, what, what we're, um, uh, what our contribution, our main contribution to healthcare is, it's a definition of what primary care is. Primary care is not where you just get vaccines and you get your, your annual uh, you know, wellness you know, checkups and you know, glorify referral specialist. This is the place where you build a medical home, where you have all what we call these signature services in an aligned relationship where the healthier the patient is, the better we do, and vice versa. Uh, we at, at Cano Health here, you know, Maggie, where are we? Probably six, 7,000 lives already. Uh, we're going to be at a multiple of that uh, very soon. And I gotta tell you, although we do a, a fair amount of, of marketing, most of our patients come because they notice you know, that difference. And the more we can push the market, to adopt it, to invest in that primary care and prevention, and not just stitch together a bunch of uh, clinics through the different contractual you know, arrangements that uh, are mostly predicated on billing for services and volume of services. Optum, I know our friends over there, maybe 20, 30% of their business is in such value-based relationships. The rest is fee-for-service. Soon. My plan is to be number one in the Las Vegas market and to be America's primary care. If Dr. Lipman uh, in, invites me back in, in a couple of years, uh, I, I think that you, you'll be very, very impressed. And by the way, you don't, and you do not need 300 you know, PCPs to serve uh, in a greater and measurable way the community. It needs to be more efficient, it needs to be more aligned, and it needs to be more based on where it should be on that primary care and prevention. Okay, you make me a problem. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I'm not going to end up getting a phone call from somebody that says I got to wait three and a half months to see a specialist because that's the norm that's in this community right now. That is an indication of how really, really sick we are. Sick we are. Dr. Lindman, I'd, I've made you a promise today. Most of our patients can see us within 24 to 48 hours, and with respect to a specialist, we have a policy that it takes no more than a week. Now, th there could be arrangements uh, whereby th there may be some subspecialties that are uh, so scarce that it may take a little longer, but it would be the uh, significant exception rather than the rule within our model of care. 
we provide referral and care coordination. That's part of the platform. It's included in the service. You get a concierge, if you will, who will make the appointment for you, who will keep those you know, providers honest, if you will. I, I need to make sure that you know, you're providing evidence-based practices. I need you to give me the, the records. What's your follow-up plan? And we will get on their case. And if uh, they initially don't listen to their PCPs, Dr. Prabhu will give them a call, and everybody listens to Dr. Prabhu. <laughs> yes, sir. Question for you. Where is your membership today with all these big companies in Medicare? Uh, we have, let's call it about 130,000 Medicare Advantage capitated lives. Um, we have many more that um, are not counted, which are still fee for service in the process of going into a value based model. We meet the patients where they're at. They want Medicare Advantage, we'll serve them in such a way. Um, they want traditional Medicare, then we have DC, one of the country's largest DCEs. They want to be in an ACO. We also have, in fact, the public data, uh, Orange, which is our ACO, three of our ACOs ranked in the top five percentile in terms of performance across the country. Uh, so we have uh, multiple on-ramps for providers, multiple on-ramps for patients. The model of care is the same across the board. Because that doesn't change. Those are the needs of all Americans. Th those are the needs of all product lines. And while some may need more specialty service, you know, think uh, Medicaid and pediatrics or uh, OBGYN, uh, and think you know, elderly care and more of arthritis related services and, and cognitive you know, services. Um, but in terms of access, quality, and wellness, those are the needs for all Americans. Thank you for that question, and sir, I'll, I'll get you next. Um, when I started, and I'm young, and I've been um, out of school, practiced medicine for about 10 years, but believe it or not, when I started my rotations um, and my training, it was still in paper. It's crazy that in the 21st century, and I trained in the 21st century, we were still in paper, nobody was talking to each other. Nowadays, we still have that problem. Do we have full connectivity here between all the hospitals and all the specialists and all the providers? And it's mandated in many ways by federal law and you have you know, fire and uh, HIE alerts and, and so on. Does it really happen? And you have all these uh, walled gardens, if you will. So um, we're holding their feet to the fire. Uh, a partner of ours, uh, we use their system, um, eClinical Works, if, if you're familiar, one of the uh, best uh, uh, EMRs across the country, electronic medical records. Their CEO, uh, Grish, uh, and I, uh, we're, we're doing a talk, and I'm gonna ask those tough questions. What are you doing to break those barriers? What are you doing to make sure that patients have their health information in an app available to them in real time? What are you doing to ensure that providers proactively can engage those patients in the care, not just from their practices, but across the board. And truth be told, because of economic interest, they have a disincentive to make those connections. So many times they'll do the absolute minimum, um, but it's critical to have a functioning healthcare system. And if anybody doubts that, look at our COVID outcomes across the board. Second year in a row, we lost life expectancy, and we didn't have to if we actually had a functioning system. I'm not talking about a single payer. Um, I'm not talking about you know, radical change. I'm talking about you know, actually mandating standards just like we mandate for most other industries. You know, think if you know, we uh, had to uh, plug into a different electric outlet or put a different type of gas in our car. I mean, it's just crazy what we've had you know, in healthcare because it hasn't been you know, standardized and we have all these special interests. Uh, and those end when you have an aligned relationship with the provider and when we are ultimately the payer. Sir, b before uh, there was a question, but I'm going to get you next. One, one quick question. How many Medicare patients do you have in your practice? Well, uh, it, in Vegas, in, in Vegas it, uh, I, I, I'd like to say 5,000 plus, but growing significantly, something uh, you know, around uh, those numbers. Yeah. Okay, thank you. 
Yeah, uh, and Medicare defined as uh, Medicare Advantage, Medicare Traditional, ACO. Um, yeah. But uh, now we're in AEP, so uh, maybe next time I come, I, I give you a significant update. Uh, yes, sir. Yeah, a really important question as well. And, and actually, I'm going to ducktail that into the previous question on, on technology. So we have this platform called Cano Panorama. And uh, that platform enables our affiliates, um, also uh, provides uh, seamless data integration across our um, spectrum you know, of care at, at Cano. And um, it's not like um, providers or healthcare professionals have to learn different systems. They're typing into their EMR, they're typing into their care management system, they're, they're, they're typing into the analytics, and it's all communicating in the background with, uh, with bridges and, and algorithms uh, to, be, um, to tailor the care and be more proactive. In doing so, what happens there is that given that um, everybody uh, has um, this more real-time access, whether it's from records uh, outside of the, the clinic uh, or within you know, our uh, spectrum of care, uh, they're able to discuss uh, with uh, the patients in, in a way that engages them more. And the more they come in, uh, the more uh, risk stratification that happens, the, the more tailoring of the programs, the more engagement gets made, the more they plug in, the more they develop those you know, relationships. And so uh, let me give you uh, an, an example um, in uh, diabetes care. So there's nothing, I think, you know, more powerful for a clinician or a patient, but for a clinician, than to uh, know that they're practicing state-of-the-art medicine and that they're being effective at what they do and sharing that data with the patient. Because show me um, what happens when you take an SGLT2 type of uh, medicine or show me you know, what happens uh, when I take um, you know, better care of uh, my kidneys or, or my neuropathy. And we've published you know, that uh, data. And then they're incentivized, as I discussed, um, and they, they have access to, to their records. But most patients, truth be told, don't really use it and the systems are still suboptimal as to you know what they do uh, but if you say hey now you've got these conditions and because of the automation that we have um, we've got this plan of care for you that's medical this plan of care that is uh, diet and, and exercise and you can plug into these you know programs and you know and here's a care manager who's going to work with you and send folks to the home as, as needed um, in order to make sure that uh, you're getting you know all of the right uh, care you know that that's what gets them thinking now there is a new frontier i don't want to give too much away but we're working on it uh, in which uh, we will have branded um, applications uh, with all sorts of tools uh, that will help patients uh, and uh, that's not too far into the future. We're not talking years, we're talking months. Yes, sir. And then. Um, it seems like the model you're describing is something that health has done for 35 years, and health departments have done for 25 years, and we've still got this 48 in, in Nevada. How, how, would, how would this model you're describing be any different than that? And how is it better? And why would I go with you instead of that? I think you need to ask for patience. Um, and um, I, I think that uh, there are um, um, certain cultural barriers, uh, let me just uh, say there, and understanding of historically underserved uh, communities. That's a, let's call it non-medical component, but just as important. Uh, and then there um, are those services. You know, how integrated you know, are there? Uh, and uh, how um, you know, holistic the approach is? Does Southwest Medical offer uh, free PRP for arthritis uh, or ozone uh, therapy? Uh, do they have um, a, uh, a nationwide recognized uh, you know, program where CTAs are free for the patient, calcium scoring, uh, carotid screening, executive screenings you know, for our patients? 
do they have um, integrated within their healthcare approach um, a 24-7 urgency line and uh, diet and exercise you know, programs that are tailored to the patient? My guess is they probably don't. So I don't think we're doing the same things. I think we're trying to do the same things, um, but I think we're also stimulating progress. And uh, I, I hope they, they, they continue to, uh, to match and top because that's what uh, transforms the healthcare system. There was an, a question there, a question here. I noticed a, a, a bit of a pit bull accent. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Nevada is Miami? Uh, Miami? Yeah, from Miami. Yeah, of course. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, uh, oh, so, so there's three of us. Uh, okay, great. <laughs> I know pretty well. No, I know. Oye, no, muy bien. Después hablamos. I know pretty well uh, how Sonia works and how Arturo Oh, they're, all, they're them, amazing. Your guys are growing. Thanks to the doctors here in Nevada that have been working for a long time trying to make this uh, patient compliant and our own nation. You guys are growing because you have the dollars to, uh, you know, to invest and you decided to invest in that. Because like I said, I've been working in, in this uh, field for 10 years and in Florida. And so it's been 20 years. And it's great what you're doing again. I'm not saying that you know, it's bad or I think you're great. But you know, we're all uh, asking questions about what are you doing different? They're not doing really anything different but investing in good talent and doctors that are great. That, you know, well, you're that definitely right about that second part. Um, <laughs> the, the, so, and uh, let, let me tell you, uh, I, I agree and disagree with you, uh, as you can imagine. Okay. Um, so I agree, we invest in talent and uh, patients first, uh, and they must have the best you know, clinicians and, and healthcare professionals. Those are committed that share our values. And we've done a significant you know, amount of that and will continue. Um, but uh, money alone doesn't give you the, uh, the growth of the differentiation because it's about the actual services and the published outcomes. So uh, just going to Tropicana or East Craig or West Craig and, and those places, they were built from scratch. Um, and uh, we are proud that we employ, what is it now, you know, 400 you know, individuals here in, in Las Vegas. That's gonna continue to grow you know, very significantly. All local, so we're not uh, uh, teleporting anybody here from uh, Miami or, or, or Texas. I think we should partner together. I think we need to talk because I, I see you highly passionate about your FQAC, and, and we need them. Um, and the, and there there are uh, there are there 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 are there. 
th th there, are, there are options for sure. Th th there are there are options for for sure, um, but not enough. Um, and and um, you know, in terms of the value-based care, you know, arrangements, we, we dig deeper and honest as you are with me. How really aligned? What published data do you have? And what signature services do you have? Um, and so uh, I, I think we should talk. Um, and um, you're absolutely right on one thing. We will continue to invest in Las Vegas because we will continue to invest in healthcare transformation. Okay, I, I get two calls, one on the delay between primary care, and then the call is, how do we get a hold of you people to do a credential, to provide the network? And if they're calling me, it means they've had a problem. So you need to tell us who they get a hold of and how they back up. Yes, uh, so um, I, I'm gonna um, exercise executive privilege here, and you call Maggie. Uh, because uh, she yeah, will, uh, <laughs> um, and, and, and we've got really good people there. We have to work with the payers, and th th that, that is also a system that, that needs to continue to evolve because it's, it's really based on the more you know, traditional or historical approach. It's kind of like doctor by doctor rather than group practice in models, um, but um, that is something we're, we're actively working. Hello, Amelia. Good to see you. Uh, there was another question somewhere. Well, and, and, and the average is only that because we serve all demographics. But if we just take seniors, it would be more close to your average, 73 or so. Um, and uh, yes, we are infatuated with keeping them healthy, <laughs> with having them lead a longer and healthier life. And as I just described with these services, with these proactive mechanisms, with our national care platform that we've defined as access, quality, and wellness, let's talk more. and. Uh, you know, we'll have a, a conversation as to you know sharing of our best practices, you know for sure. Sir, there was a question in the back. Yes, sir. Yeah, I'm, I'm not from Miami, but I have left with a few hangovers in the past. <laughs> <laughs> I have a question. Are you, are you talking about the physio? Does that then buy licensed physical therapists? And if not, do you think that needs to be generative? Uh, so we call it physiotherapy, as in the redefinition of um, primary care. We basically coined that term internally, what that means to us. It's not physical therapy. We do have some physical therapists, and that could be a part of the offering there. But generally, there are good networks around the country for physical therapy. But here's what there's not enough of. It's done by nurse practitioners, and it's done by PAs, in some cases doctors. So those are the providers that are doing the care for our physiotherapy. They're doing joint injections. They're working with acupuncturists. They're working with the patient um, on alternative and complementary therapies that include like massage and include like the ozone, PRP, and, and so on. Um, when you talk about physical therapy, you're talking about like more like rehab, and we will send our patients to that. But is there really a arthritis clinic, you know, within physiotherapy? So it's really addressing what um, seem to fall through the cracks of the system because of the reimbursement model. You get the orthopedics, and I got a lot of orthopedic friends. They'll replace every knee they see. And you've got all the physical therapists that are going to be limited in that kind of manual, non-medical approach. And then there's gonna be some safeguards in terms, you know, have you given the steroid injection? You know, have you tried the NSAIDs and all of those good things? But that is not enough. And we have complementary and alternative medical programs that help. And we've done the research among our own uh, patient base. Um, and again, patients will go over their feet and you can go and talk to our patients. About 70% of our patients get better. And this is uh, thousands and thousands of patients that we have followed you know, throughout the years. Probably on a daily basis, we see you know, probably, I don't know, a thousand patients a day for our physiotherapy offering. When it comes to 
uh, let's call it uh, traditional physical therapy and rehab, we typically will refer that out. All right, so I think I've exhausted all the questions. Don't forget we have the Game of Thrones next month, which will be regarding the medical district. And I think it's going to be a slam dunk in terms of what's going on down there. It has totally exceeded my expectations. It's been just superb. Hopefully it'll be help <coughs> part of the solution. Uh, please stay and uh, ask any questions you'd like. There's no rush. And uh, thank you very much for an outstanding Thank you very much. Thank you.